Yes, we can hear you. Okay. All right. Good morning and welcome to session 200. Or if you're in Europe, like our speaker, good afternoon. If you're joining us from Asia, hope you're having a great night. Well, while these are really troubling times, we are fortunate to be able to connect with our fellow astronomers at this meeting. Um, hi there, I'm Philip Stansel, and I'm the chair of the Laboratory Astrophysics Division. LAD is the youngest division in AAS, being founded in 2013. And um, there we go. the vision is a diverse collection of physicists, chemists, surface scientists, planetary scientists, and astrophysicists, all motivated to study the fundamental processes that control the universe. Our members have connections to nearly all divisions in the AAS. In addition to this plenary lecture, we have also organized six oral sessions and four eye posters. I hope you will have a chance to see the exciting work represented by the members of our division at this meeting. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce the LAD plenary speaker, Dr. Paolo Casilli, who is director of the Max Planck Institute for uh, Extraterrestrial Physics in Garchi. Uh, she's a visiting professor at the University of Leeds and also a courtesy professor at the University of Florida. Dr. Casilli received her PhD from the University of Bologna in astronomy, and today is one of the leading scientists in the astrochemistry of star and planet formation. So as befitting our division, Paolo's talk is titled, The Crucial Interplay of Laboratory Experiments, Observations, and Theory to Unveil Our Astrochemical Origins. All right, let's welcome, please, Dr. Casilli. Thank you very much. And there's the virtual applause. I'm sure. <laughs> All right, so I will now share my screen. Yes, I'll get you started. And let's get started. Great, so I assume everybody's seeing my slide uh, now. So uh, what I will do today, I will uh, uh, take you through a journey from uh, interstellar clouds to basically our Earth and uh, try to convince you that uh, really to understand our origins and our heritage from uh, the original cloud from which everybody, every one of us has been uh, um, uh, born, uh, we really, really need uh, to uh, have a crucial interplay between uh, uh, important, three important pillars of astrochemistry. One is the laboratory work, one is uh, sensitive observations, and uh, the other one, of course, is the theory, both chemistry and the physics. So, but of course, because of the limited amount of time, I will uh, basically just uh, take you through this journey from a large scale. I hope you can see my uh, cursor. These are like parser scales down to basically where we live to get today, so in, uh, in the planet. You see here several molecules, and the molecules are important for two main reasons. One is because they're really, um, they kind of uh, catapulted us in the remote sensing astronomy because with them we can study the physics and the dynamics of these clouds and also understand how stars form and how planets form, especially now with the super powerful telescopes. On the other hand, all these, many of these molecules, as we will see, are actually building blocks of much larger molecules and prebiotic molecules. And so they tell us, in a sense, the history of uh, our, uh, say, um, of living beings like uh, ourselves. So let me start with the first uh, table that uh, summarizes the molecules that have been detected uh, so far. This is actually updated through Feb February uh, this year. So you can see we have uh, 218 molecules. And uh, these molecules, many of them are uh, uh, organic in nature. So they have, uh, uh, of course, the carbon atoms in them. And uh, you can see here, maybe it's just uh, too many for you, but I can show you just uh, some of them. Some of them are really, uh, they say, first steps uh, toward prebiotic molecules, like, for example, the amino acetonitrile that was discovered 2008 by the Lotion collaborators. That is just one step away 
from glycine, which is the simplest amino acid. So now you can see that with all this amount of molecules, once we know the frequencies of these molecules at, in, uh, with high precision, and this can be done, of course, in a laboratory, molecular spectroscopy laboratory, then we can use this molecule to have uh, not just an understanding of the physical structure of a cloud, but actually a 3D picture of this cloud going from the outer part to the inner regions and actually piece these things together in a big puzzle that, uh, that then can give us the 3D picture of uh, star formation and now also planet formation. We need to understand also another thing, and this is part of the motivation of my talk, is that uh, when we look at the primitive material in our solar system, for, for example, carbonaceous chondrites, so we see a lot of prebiotic molecules, basically all the ingredients that we need to make, uh, to assemble uh, living beings, uh, including, in fact, amino acids, mo much more than what we need. For example, we use only 20 amino acids uh, in, uh, in life in, on Earth but actually more than 200 have been discovered so far in, this carbon, in some of these carbonaceous chondrites. We have fatty acids to make uh, basically a cell membrane, and we have also nucleobases uh, to uh, make, uh, uh, of course, uh, our uh, genetic code and the RNA and DNA. So this is, of course, very interesting. We want to understand how this comes about, especially because these carbonaceous chondrites, as we will see also in respect with, say, deuterium fractionation, as I will talk about it later on, this is very important because most likely they have enriched our Earth with volatiles in the late stages, soon after the formation of, of our planet. So this is the outlook of my uh, talk. So as I said, I will take you from dark clouds uh, and crystal, of course, in our galaxy. And uh, I will uh, show you how astrochemistry and, of course, uh, uh, laboratory astrochemistry and also theoretical astrochemistry is absolutely uh, important uh, to understand these various phases of star and planet formation. So I'll talk about diffractionation, so the, the fractionation of deuterium that actually helps us a lot to uh, measure and understand what's happening in the very center of cold uh, and uh, very dense clouds where actually stars are going to form uh, soon. I will also talk about what we call uh, complex organic molecules, which are molecules with more than six atoms in size for astronomers. I will then move to protoplanetary disk formation and then tower the stellar, stellar systems like our own. So let me start with uh, this beautiful uh, uh, picture. It's an optical picture of our Milky Way. So you can see, of course, recognized very well here, the dark lanes, the uh, Milky Way, so all these stars in the background. And these uh, dark lanes are clouds that, of course, are filled with cold gas and dust that absorb this background starlight. So as you can see, optical telescopes are not very important for the study of these uh, uh, clouds because they are not able to see much within these clouds. In fact, what we need, we need molecules. And of course, we need molecules and very high uh, precision. Uh, we need to know with high precision the frequencies that we are looking at. This is, for example, the CO120, uh, and uh, this is, uh, say, the most abundant molecule in the universe after H2, and in fact is a very good tracer of uh, H2, and this is the 2.6 millimeter transition that was mapped along the whole galaxy by Dame, Hartmann, and Thaddeus in 2001. So you can see that we're you see dark uh, in optical line, uh, optical, uh, with optical telescopes, so you see very bright lines of the CO. And in fact, these uh, CO lines are so bright that we actually can see only the skin of the cloud. So because the line becomes very optically thin, thick uh, very soon, so we need actually to go deeper. And for that, other molecules are important. So if we want to get a piece of uh, a dark cloud, so these are mostly giant molecular cloud in our, in our uh, galaxy, we can zoom in within a dark cloud. And this for, is, uh, for example, a small regions that we have studied a lot. And this is uh, the dust continuum emission at 500 micrometers as uh, viewed by Herschel. So here, uh, 
you see in this bright spot is where we see evidence of contraction motions, again, thanks to uh, molecular uh, lines. And in fact, if we zoom in here, now we are at, uh, uh, say, about 10,000, 20,000 astronomical units in size, we can see that uh, uh, very well that inside this dark cloud, we have a so-called pre-stellar core. And the pre-stellar core can be uh, seen both, of course, in millimeter dust continuum emission, because uh, here we are at very low temperature, as we will see, and uh, very specific molecules are needed to study these, uh, these regions. As you see, the density, central densities are larger than a million H2 molecule per cubic centimeter. And uh, depending on where you are, and particularly if you are interested in how stars are forming, you need to concentrate in this very bright center here, where you see uh, the, say, uh, gravitational potential well, and where actually most of the molecules, unfortunately, are gone. And this is uh, the reason why they are uh, gone. So this is another observational evidence that uh, we found uh, uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, here is uh, work by Krapsi and collaborators with the VLA uh, and Effelsberg antennas. So we found that the temperature within this course goes down to six Kelvin. So you can see here that uh, the uh, densities are a million per cubic centimeter, uh, temperature at six Kelvin, molecules that are continuously colliding with this cold dust, what they will do will basically just be stuck on the surface of these dust grains. And here it comes the importance of understanding that this interface between gas phase and solid uh, uh, phase uh, chemistry and physics. And this is why many laboratories around the world are trying to uh, give us um, important numbers, like, for example, binding energies that are needed to understand and follow this chemistry. So what we know in the center of this course is that more than 90% of the CO molecules that are in the gas phase are here in solid form. So they are just uh, uh, forming a thick icy mantle on top of uh, the carbon ashes or silicate, amorphous silicate core of the grains. And the other thing that we see is that the deuterium fraction becomes very, uh, very high. And uh, consider that the Gilbert H ratio in our, uh, say, galaxy, in our universe, is uh, of the order of 10 to the minus 5, the over H elemental abundance. But what we see is that the D over H is actually 20% or more. So this is actually very good because it means that there are some molecules, especially the deuterated ones and especially the light ones, that can stay uh, in the gas phase uh, and give us clues on the dynamics and the physical structure of these uh, uh, clouds. So you can see here what we expect to find in this uh, pre-stellar core just before the protostar switches on. So we have the silicate and carbonaceous material in the center and then a thick icy mantles around. Mostly, uh, so the, the, the most important molecule, the most abundant molecule is, of course, uh, water. But we have also a lot of CO because we have this freeze out of CO that I was just uh, telling you. And then other important molecules are, of course, the CO2 that are also seen along the line of sight, for example, of embedded or background sources. Uh, and uh, also methanol, CH3OH. One thing that, as I said, water is very abundant in these uh, um, ices. So it was, in a sense, a, some kind of a surprise to find that actually water is also present in uh, vapor form in, uh, in the center of this pre-stellar core. This was our uh, work that was done in 2012, thanks to the sensitivity of, of Herschel. And I have to say also thank very much, and without that it was impossible, to the theoretical work that was done on the collisional coefficients of water with para and ortho H2 that allowed us to model the uh, line profile of the water in uh, this particular cloud that we knew from other molecules that it was in fact contracting. And this is why in fact we saw this beautiful inverse P signi profile that was in fact the first evidence of water vapor in this cold and dense environment. And uh, we could uh, uh, understand from here several things, including subsonic infall, so this cloud, which is highly supercritical and it should basically free fall if 
there were no other ingredients like except for thermal pressure and gravity uh, but in fact we think that there are probably strong magnetic field this line profile gives us evidence of subsonic infall within the central 1000 AU so we have this waterfall of material really going toward the center of the cloud and the center of the cloud is where the protoplanetary disk and the future stellar system will form we also measured the total mass of water and the water vapor was only half of earth mass but this um, if we compare this, if we wanted to reproduce this with our chemical models, we needed a, a total mass of water ice in this uh, uh, cloud of about three Jupiter masses. So there is already a lot of water that you can provide uh, to the future uh, stellar system. Another important thing that we found out is that cosmic rays are very important because they are the ones that provide the energy, energetic processes for the water to absorb from this ice form and go back in the gas phase. And how they do that? Well, they actually collide with H2 molecules, so they excite H2 molecules, and these H2 molecules de-excite fluoresce back in the ground state, producing this UV field, very tenuous, more than, say, 10,000 times less, uh, say, stronger than the interstellar radiation field. But this is just enough to have photodesorption, and especially, say, of water and uh, other uh, molecules that are, on the, uh, say, present on the surface of these dust grains. So here it comes another important point that we need uh, of course, uh, theory as well as uh, experiments on this point of irradiation and bombardment of ISIS. In fact, I mean, uh, you can imagine uh, these uh, small dust grains, so we are talking about a fraction of a micrometer in size, that are actually very important, as we know since many, many years, uh, since the 60s, uh, when Gold and Salpeter actually uh, sorted out how H2 molecules form on the surface uh, of dust grains that uh, you can uh, consider them as very important catalytic surfaces where a lot of chemistry is going on. First of all, we have H2 forming, but of course you also have this accumulation of ice, water on one side, uh, as I said, the CO in some other regions, in the denser region of the cloud and CO2, and you can actually build uh, a lot of uh, monolayers, like hundreds of monolayers of, uh, of ice. And then you have, of course, uh, uh, many processing going on. You can have UV photons, especially if you are in the outer part of the cloud, but you have also the UV photons produced by cosmic rays, as I just said. And uh, all these uh, provides energetic processes that alter the chemical composition of this ice. So what are the predictions from uh, say the theory and from the laboratory. In fact, there are lots of uh, uh, experiments going on, uh, um, have been going on <clears throat> since uh, several years, uh, but also with the uh, new machines, uh, uh, we have more and more, say, experiments that help us to actually refine our theories. So, for example, at the, here at the Max Planck for Extraterrestrial Physics, we have a plasma physicist, Alexei Ivlev, who is working, in fact, on the penetration of these energetic particles across icy uh, mantles and, and icy dust grains. This work has started in 2015, and we are now uh, proceeding in implementing in, uh, say, a more comprehensive chemical code. So you can see that once you have a cosmic ray penetrating, you have like a hot cylinder, and with this, within this hot cylinder, you have basically hot chemistry going on, and this is what we need from the experiment to actually refine our predictions and our, uh, uh, say, uh, theories. One way, for example, that um, is very important, uh, say, um, uh, way that uh, has been uh, uh, started by Chris Schindler-Decker. He was a student, actually, at Virginia uh, State, uh, um, at Virginia University, at the uh, chemistry department with uh, Eric Herbst. And now he's here as a Humboldt Fellow um, at the, the Max Planck. So he has uh, been doing this very important uh, um, way to try to reproduce what experiments uh, find. For example, here, this is a track of uh, a proton of about 100 uh, kilo electron volt proton that is penetrating an O2 ice. Uh, this is uh, uh, 
is uh, say has been done experimentally. And Chris, what he has done, he has followed the uh, this trace of uh, the proton and the production of the secondary electrons that, of course, are produced during the penetration of the ice and following the chemistry in these regions where you have the secondary electrons that of course can excite or dissociate and activate the new chemistry. And what he found, for example, is that we, with this uh, inclusion of energetic particles like the cosmic rays, you can produce more, um, so, um, significantly higher amount of or complex organic molecules like this the ubiquitous uh, molecule that is seen in the star forming regions everywhere in uh, in our galaxy and also in the colder regions so it's very easy to form so apparently this cosmic ray really help um, if you want to see this in 3d chris actually gave me this beautiful 3d picture that you can give you an idea of what is happening when you have like an energetic proton coming from the interstellar medium are crossing, hitting. This is the surface of your eyes, and this is the uh, core of the dust, and you can see that you have a lot of uh, uh, chemistry going on, because where you have these uh, secondary electrons, you can have, for example, dissociation of water, production of radicals that become very, uh, say, important for a future generation of, uh, of uh, more complex uh, uh, molecules. More recently, what Chris has done, he has shown that actually with the inclusion, and this is something that would be nice to, uh, in fact, uh, prove more quantitatively with experiments, that with the inclusion of these uh, cosmic rays uh, in the chemistry, sulfur, which is mainly hydrogenated to H2S, can actually transform itself in uh, allotrope. So, so you can form this chain of sulfurs in, with the most stable one being S8. And you can see that you can accumulate as a function of time a lot of S8 in ice bulk, so in the whole mantle of, of the uh, dust grain, unlike, for example, if you do not consider cosmic rays at all. And the, it, the interesting thing is that recently, there have been some evidence that, in fact, these allotropes are present in comets, like especially in the 67P um, comet that has been recently uh, visited by Rosetta. This is a paper Calmonte that actually explained this fact. So it's really important to understand cosmic rays. Very briefly, I don't want to go into the details, but so we have to take into account that cosmic rays are not just important so for coming from, say, the, uh, the whole galaxy accelerated by the supernovae, but there is evidence that actually these cosmic rays are also produced locally by young nascent stars. We know that our, uh, say, young star emitted the high flux of energetic particles uh, larger than, say, 10 MeV, mega electron volt, and these produce, for example, um, uh, like a short-lived uh, radium uh, nuclei, like uh, uh, beryllium-10, that in fact is uh, uh, present in trace in some uh, in some meteorites. So, in this work by Padovani and collaborators, it has been shown that in fact you can have a large amount of this uh, energetic particle accelerated. This is say the disk of the protostar. This is the central protostar, and this is the jet where these particles are accelerated. And uh, what we see, in fact, when we measure uh, specific molecules that give us information about uh, the um, ionization fraction, that the cosmic ionization rate is uh, significantly higher than even the one that we actually measure in diffuse clouds. So that is of the order of 10 to the minus 16 per second. And you can see here a work that has been uh, led uh, uh, originally by Cecilia Ceccarelli in 2014 and more recently by Fontani and Fabre with the Noema, uh, Iram Noema array, uh, we find that the, this cosmic ionization rate is very large. So these processes are really important and need to be taken into account. And these are some uh, data, for example, that also show that uh, in, uh, in OMC2, this is the Orion, one of the uh, clusters that are found in the Orion Nebula, we finally found, so in the regions where we measure this high ionization rate, we finally found a very uh, clear 
evidence of jet where these particles are in fact accelerated. So let me now go to the deuterium fraction. In a sense, it's all connected together because we will see that in fact cosmic rays are important because they ionize H2 97% of the time, and then this H2 plus forms, reacts with H2 and form H3 plus. And uh, when, when this is done with the deuterated molecules, we will see this will start the deuterium chemistry. But before I start with that, that will not take very long, uh, I just wanted to give you again some motivation, extra motivation about this. Why do we care about these deuterated molecules? Well, first of all, we care because they are very good tracers of these highly obscure, dense, cold regions just before stars are formed. So if we care to know the initial conditions of how star, uh, stars form and also how protoplanetary disks form, we need to know these deuterated molecules. However, we also are interested in that because we know that our oceans are deuterated. If we compare the D over H ratio measured in water with the protosolar nebula or say the interstellar medium D over H, we see that the Earth ocean is 10 times more deuterated. And the interesting thing is that when you compare our ocean D over H ratio with the comets, and with the carbon ashes uh, meteorites that, as I just said, is most likely that brought in the volatiles and the water, you see that, in fact, there is a very good uh, uh, coincidence here that uh, carbon ashes meteorites and the Earth have a very similar D over H ratio, while the comets tend to be a bit higher up in this D over H ratio, except for this Hartley 2 that was measured with uh, Herschel. Now, if one wants to reproduce the D over H ratio that is measured in our oceans, starting with just a disk without taking into account the history of this disk, of the material out of which this disk has formed, well, that's a problem because the people in the past have seen that this is not easy to do. And there was this uh, nice paper uh, by Ilsa Cliffs and collaborators in 2014 that in fact showed exactly this. We need to bring in some of this early water formed and deuterated water formed in the early phases of the star formation, so in this pre-stellar phase, Phase to actually make sure that we can reproduce the values that we see today. So how does this work? This is very easy. So you see here the H3+. plus. This is the most important uh, molecular ion in astrochemistry, as I said, formed from H2 and cosmic rays. Once it encounters HD, so we believe that in molecular clouds, the deuterium is mostly in this form, uh, molecular form, HD, it forms this H2D plus uh, plus H2. And this is an exothermic reaction. And this was actually uh, underlined many years ago by Watson in 1974. There was another paper 10 years after that from Dalgarno and Lepp and other theoretical studies showing that if for some reasons molecules like CO, oxygen, heavy neutrals that are in fact the ones that destroy H3 plus and H2D plus. This appears from the gas phase, for example, because of freeze out. They didn't say about freeze out at that time because we didn't know about this concept at that time, but they say, well, could be, you know, a universe type of chemistry or some kind of low metallicity environment. Then this H2D plus over H3 plus increases. In fact, this is, you can immediately understand this because, if, for example, if you know that the CO, let's just focus on CO, is the main destructor partner of H3 plus and H2, uh, H2D plus. If a CO freezes out, you can see immediately that the destruction rate of both H2D plus and H3 plus lower, and the formation rate of H2D plus becomes higher because you have more H3 plus. So this is actually going uh, faster. So what you have here in total is that the larger H2D plus over H3 plus abundance ratio and the deuterium fraction. Now, we tried with, at that time, it was the CSO, so the uh, Caltech uh, uh, Submillimeter Observatory in the early 2000s to actually measure this H2D plus in these cold regions because we believed it was supposed to be abundant. 
But our models were not good enough at that time. We didn't think of uh, you know, having doubly deuterated molecules or triply deuterated molecules. So, so we failed to reproduce what we, in fact we saw with the CSO. We saw a very bright line, almost one Kelvin line. We predicted 10 times less bright with our chemical model at that time. So these observations allowed us to actually to refine our model and it triggered an amazingly uh, good uh, laboratory work that helped us so much to understand what we were looking at because we needed collisional coefficients and of course we needed also the rate coefficients for these reactions to uh, actually implement in our chemistry. And you can see here that it's not just H3 plus and H2D plus that are important to say actors in this uh, uh, say scenario but uh, you can keep going until D3+. Plus. And in fact, D2H plus has been detected uh, with Apex and also with the SOFIA. Actually, SOFIA has been very important to actually measure uh, specific uh, um, forms of these molecules, in particular, the para H2D plus and the R to D2H plus that are at very high frequency. And even you know, with, uh, uh, say, CSO or Apex, it, it is very hard to, to find. So what happens here is that when you reach your gas phase with these molecular ions, you can see that on one side, they can produce these abundant deuterated molecules like DCO plus if they react with CO or N2D plus if they react with <clears throat> N2. On the other hand, if they recombine with electrons, they release a lot of deuterium atoms. And these deuterium atoms can compete with the hydrogen atoms to deuterate the molecule on the surface. So if you have, for example, CO on the surface, you, will can, you can get a large amount of deuterated methanol on the surface of dust grains, which has been, in fact, detected. So this is, in fact, the detections that actually are a bit, is a bit out, out of date here, but they, uh, there is no uh, how to say, the conclusions are the same, even if we include the more newer, say, observations here. This is from a review paper that uh, we wrote in 2012, pointing out that the deuteration of uh, methanol and also formaldehyde is extremely high. You can see here, you can have the triply deuterated methanol at high level. We talk about orders of magnitude increase in the diffraction in the methanol, while water keeps, yes, it can be deuterated, but not at such a high level. So how can it be that water is less deuterated than uh, organic molecules? We understood this uh, with, uh, if we think about ice formation time, and I'll show you in this slide here. So if we take our dark cloud and the crystalline core chorus here in the, in the center, you can see that in the outer part, you start building water. But in this region, there is not much CO freeze out. So the H2D plus over H3 plus ratio is still quite low. There is not much CO freeze out. So basically, you don't have this extra deuteration a la Dalgarno and Lep that I explained a few minutes ago. However, as you go, so water, yes, can be deuterated because it, the gas is cold, but not super deuterated. The super deuteration becomes active when you actually get to the point that you have this catastrophic CO result. And here is when you have this very thick icy mantles, D over H start to become very large, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and then you get a large amount of deuterated methanol. The interesting thing is that when we look, for example, so this is what we see in our star forming region. When you look at the comet, and this is uh, uh, the beautiful work that has been described uh, by Katrin Altweg, Balziger, and uh, Fuselier in uh, 2019 in the uh, Annual Review of Astronomy Astrophysics, look at this. So you have the D over H in water is still high. We already saw that a few times higher than the D over H in our ocean, which is already 10 times higher than the ISM D over H. Then, then let's look at the D over H in organics, methanol and HCM. Well, this is actually 10 times higher than that. Very similar to what we see in, 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 in the star forming regions. And what about uh, our solar system, so other pieces of our solar system, like this primitive material, like the carbonaceous chondrites. Same story. When we look at the hydrated silicates, so this is where actually the water is, um, is represented by, and the D over H ratio is 
is uh, the same as our oceans. And these I already pointed out. When we look at the uh, hot spots where we have actually organic material, we see that the D over H ratio can go up to 1%. So again, you see orders of magnitude the higher. Uh, and th this is really, uh, I think, uh, very interesting to make this link from you know, cloud to our solar system. Something must have been preserved to our days. Now, let me go into the complex organic molecules, what we think they are complex organic molecules as astronomers. And this is a, a beautiful example, again, coming from Herschel. This was the Hexos team from uh, Ted Bergen and collaborators, of course, Orion. I have lots of, uh, um, say, uh, lots of uh, organic molecules and uh, precursor of prebiotic molecules. But we also have these organic molecules uh, and, uh, um, say, complex organic molecules, we, we will see, also in pre-stellar course. So it seems that this uh, uh, complex organic molecules start to form in these very early phases where you have this uh, low temperature between 6 and 10 Kelvin, this catastrophic C-off result, and this interesting chemistry going on on the surface and also in the gas phase, as we will see. So Silvia Spezzano here at uh, MPE, she found out that if you actually study in detail, this was the, with the IRAM 30 meter telescope, one of these pre-stellar cores, and uh, you, you can actually uh, find families of molecules, the nitrogen bearing molecules that all like to stay in, or say peak, tower the dust peak. So the nitrogen is very good actually at peaking in the center of these uh, cold regions. While for example, methanol and also these other molecules here uh, are shifted up toward the north, carbon chains so like C3H2, but also HC3N, et cetera, they are opposite to the methanol. And this was very interesting because we knew that this was telling us something very important about the environmental conditions. And this is in fact a larger view of our pristellar core. You can see that toward the south, you are actually just at the edge of the molecular cloud, just a little bit beyond, you are in the kind of atomic phase. And this is where you have a lot of carbon atoms still in the gas phase that can form carbon chains. However, this is the region where methanol is formed. And we said that methanol is actually formed on the surface of dust grains. So there are strong evidences also, of course, from the laboratory work, but also from the fact that there is no, it's not possible to form a methanol at the abundances that we measure with gas phase chemistry. So this is, uh, these are other molecules that we detected with this is work uh, from Imenesera, in past on Imenesera. Yes? Four minutes. Ah, okay. And uh, you can see here that uh, you have uh, a lot of, uh, say, uh, larger molecules that if you have uh, significant, uh, say, sensitivity. Uh, from ALMA, again, we can tell that, uh, for example, going from nitrogen bearing molecules to methanol, methanol is always staying in uh, one side of the core away from the radiation field. So basically, you need to have CO molecules that are, say, um, freezing on the surface of the grains, forming methanol there, and then in some, for some reasons, a part of this methanol is released in the gas phase. And this is, for example, is what uh, uh, Anton Vazunin found with his models here at uh, MPE. And for this, it was uh, crucial to have a rate of, uh, for example, neutral-neutral uh, reactions and also, um, say, reactive desorption experiments that were done in France uh, with the uh, new uh, experiments. So here you can see the abundance as a function of radius with peak of molecules that are about, uh, say, 0 0.1 uh, parsecs away from the center. Here is all free, frozen out for the oxygen bearing complex organic molecules. And here you have the peaks uh, of, say, approximately where, we, in fact, we found the methanol peaks. So I think I have to skip some of these. So this is actually the experiment that showed the importance of neutral-neutral uh, reaction. Here is when you have this hydrogen bond, bonded complex that uh, actually allow these uh, reactions to happen also at low, especially at low temperature, but I have no time here. And this is actually to explain how the uh, 
reactive desorption actually increases for methanol and formaldehyde once you have a CO rich uh, surface. Of course, uh, in uh, presence, so if you are nearby a um, say um, nearby in um, star forming region, you can have uh, heating uh, here and you can at least desorb some of these ices. And what we see in these regions when we compare, for example, with the, uh, again, with the Rosetta, uh, so comet 67P, we see a very good uh, correlation between the abundances of complex organics and those uh, that are found in uh, one young stellar objects, in particular in this IRA 16293 that has been uh, surveyed with ALMA by Jorgensen and collaborators in the field survey. And uh, here, these are the molecules found in uh, Rosetta, with Rosetta uh, mission. So again, what this correlation tell us? Well, it tell us that the volatile composition of cometesimals and planetesimals is partially inherited from the pre and protostellar phases of evolution. So we definitely have this. Uh, PO has been also uh, detected in space and in the comets, again, with similar abundances respect to other molecules, again, telling us that this, uh, there is a strong link with these pre-stellar phases. So now here, uh, I mean, from my watch, I can see I have still four minutes from now, but maybe I don't know uh, if I'm a little bit uh, um, uh, behind. But in any case, what I want to show you now is uh, just some new, uh, say, results that have been found for the formation of protoplanetary disks, especially in, uh, say, in my, in my group, that can have also consequences also for the chemistry of these ices and future, uh, say, processing of the ices in later stages of uh, planet formation. First of all, I mean, it's very important to remember that it's very hard to form disks theoretically because you have magnetic field and you can have the so-called magnetic breaking that basically make uh, um, uh, when you have gas contracting and rotating it loses angular momentum so you are not able anymore to form disks and it is important uh, to uh, to show that in fact this is all related to the microphysics and the chemistry so implementing uh, some simple chemistry that follows ionization and the charging of dust grains so that is very important in, uh, in these regions that are magnetized, we show that it is uh, uh, crucial to get rid of the very small grains. So this includes, for example, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or everything that is between 10 and 100 ang uh, angstrom. And you can see here, comparing the, these two uh, movies, one without the very small grains and one with the very small grains, Without the very small grains, so you can actually form a pretty good, uh, pretty big uh, uh, disks. And changing cosmic rayonization rates, so you can form large or small disks, etc. The interesting thing about this removal of small grains is that where do they go? Well, again, they go in the ice. So the suggestion is that these, uh, for example, pHs or small grains will enrich the ice chemistry and probably they will be the precursor of what we see now in our solar system as insoluble organic matter. So, of course, these models can reproduce various disks that have been observed. I will uh, uh, skip uh, uh, here very quickly, just saying that this is a very recent result. In fact, I shouldn't uh, show uh, <laughs> yet in a sense, but showing that actually a protostar is fed not just by you know, the protostellar disk, but also by a large uh, streamer of material that connect the disk to the mother cloud. And we also see now evidence of uh, probably planet forming in these very early stages of star formation. So I uh, would like to uh, stop my talk here, uh, saying that uh, basically we see this uh, similar chemistry in uh, all the, the phases, also during the protoplanetary disk formation. Of course, now it's a, an extra, how to say, um, we need to go farther and understand how planets form. And this is work that is done by other groups. So I don't need here to stay too long, but just saying that the, the whole thing is very dynamics and we still need to use 
in, in, say, dynamical models, MHD models, so to actually connect finally to the um, atmospheric, uh, atmospheres of, uh, uh, of planets. So let me just uh, skip all this and uh, I want to finish, sorry, with this, uh, just saying again that uh, this has been all possible and uh, it is, uh, uh, say, we still have a lot of work uh, to do thanks to this continuous interplay between laboratory experiment theory and observations and following these uh, main four steps of astrochemistry. So sorry if I'm a little bit uh, late. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for a great talk. Okay. We have a number of questions coming in over the Q&A. I will read them and give you a chance to respond. Um, so the first one is, in protostellar formation, most of the grain surface ice is evaporated. Are the organic polymers formed in the gaseous, the collapsed gaseous phase or grain surface? Okay, so this is, uh, first of all, it's not clear that everything is evaporated. Okay, so because uh, in fact, what we see, we see like uh, some of these ices that are evaporating nearby, say, protostars, but you can think that, of course, not all the ices within the protoplanetary disk are evaporated. So you can uh, still have a larger reservoir of this pristine material uh, there. One, however, in the regions that are very close to the protostar, where actually everything is evaporated indeed, you can then, of course, there have uh, uh, hot chemistry, so like, you know, this high temperature chemistry that can be very active and form also uh, important, say, combustion uh, uh, mo um, products uh, out of that. But remember that even after the formation of planets, as we know from our solar system, you can still have this reservoir of uh, uh, water-rich and volatile-rich pebbles and the small rocks or comets that can come in at a later stage and enrich uh, whatever has been formed close by, say, a, a star, like our sun. So like in our Earth, we had this uh, uh, late veneer bombardment that actually we think brought with it, with that water, organics, and probably all the building blocks of life. Hello? Yes, next question is from Rachel Smith. Um, how do you assess where the material is creating from, cloud versus disk, for a single target? This was the new work you showed at the end. Uh -huh. Okay, so here, um, let me see. I can try to just quickly share my screen again um, because yes, I was uh, so quick there. Um, so here, if I go back uh, a second uh, to the here. So this was the, uh, okay. So here, for example, we have a, a cloud seen with the NOEMA uh, array. And uh, here is the region that has been measured with ALMA. And uh, we find that, uh, so basically we follow dynamically. And so with the, this uh, very high precision, say accurate spectroscopic measurement, a high velocity resolution, uh, that this HC3N molecule that is not present in the dense region. So typically in the dense region, we don't have these uh, carbon chains because they're all uh, either, you know, they become CO or they are completely, say, frozen onto the surface of the strains. We see evidence that there is this material from the outer part of the cloud that is rich in HC3N down, spiraling down toward the, the central region. What happened in the very center, then of course we need the now high resolution observations of these molecules within uh, this, uh, say, at much higher resolution like with the ALMA uh, telescope. But uh, we have also other evidence from other newer work that has not been finished yet, that's why I didn't show it, that actually you have evidence of uh, material shock shocked at the surface, the outer edge of, of the disk. And then, of course, uh, uh, you know, as long as you have an envelope, you keep accreting material onto the disk. And of course, the disk is continuously evolving and accreting material onto the protostar. 
Okay, great. All right, we have time for one more question uh, from Santau Basu. The, co the higher cosmic ray ionization rate due to the YSO is very interesting. How localized would this effect be? And let me add my question to that. <laughs> what Do we have an idea of the energy distribution of the cosmic rays? Right. Right. Yes. So this is, uh, these are very, very good questions. <laughs> so uh, first of all, uh, uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. So for the moment, uh, we think, especially following the work that has been led by Padovani, that uh, the uh, particles are actually following the jet. So they should be, say, localized along, uh, say, the jet and the following, of course, the magnetic field lines. So if the jet, as we know, the jets are quite long and actually cloud the scale, not just a say disk scale, they can actually uh, go um, at uh, say parsec scale even. We don't, we, we don't have the say uh, a evidence of that so far, but we believe that these energetic particles could actually go uh, along the jet and actually uh, enriching the, say, the cloud uh, in the surrounding. From the point of view of the energy, we are talking about mainly low energy, so, you know, from MAD down, uh, that in fact are those that are important for the chemistry, both for the ionization and also for the processes that uh, we believe are enriching a lot of the chemistry in, the, in these ices. And for this, I have to underline again, we really need uh, uh, experiments and in fact we will do this uh, hopefully i mean we submitted the proposal we will do this uh, soon to say test our predictions all right fantastic well i think we have to end there now so we can move on to the next sessions so let's everyone thank paula for a fantastic talk thank you very much and i will try to answer the question and answer uh, for a few more minutes if that's okay thank you